installment of Delta State University's new colloquia program, a distinguished speaker's lecture series. The program was established really to bring top experts, all professions, from government, business, education, law, from around the country and from around the world to spend time with our students, with our faculty, with our community at Delta State, and with our neighbors out in the Delta uh, to hear some great remarks that bear on who we are and where we are, especially in the Delta. Before I proceed, I'd like to introduce a few people who are here tonight who have a distinguished background and who have been very special to Delta State and to the community. And if you'd stand and just be recognized by our friends in the audience, that would be great. First, uh, Judge Bill Bazell. Judge, where are you? Judge Bill Bazell. Longtime Chancery Court clerk, judge here in town. From Mississippi College School of Law, Dean Jim Rosenblatt. Clarksdale's new exciting mayor, Bill Luckett. And our first family going way back many years, Dr. and Mrs. Kent Wyatt. was handed a personal note late this afternoon that uh, County Judge Gwen Thomas is going to be here. Judge, here, where are you? Thank you for being here. And Senator Willie Simmons. Senator? Has not made it down 61 yet. We'll wait on you. The colloquia series will run throughout the academic year, and we have an outstanding array of speakers coming to our campus over the next nine months. Please watch for announcements of upcoming presentations on the Delta State website, through various social media, all of our campus communications channels, and through the public media. I will also be announcing colloquial programs in my weekly fireside chat blog and on Twitter. At this time, I would like to recognize those members of the Delta State family who serve on the colloquial committee and add so much to our uh, gatherings and to our planning for this year. Please stand and remain standing as I complete the list. Dr. Wayne Blancett, Dr. Elizabeth Carlson, Dr. Leslie Griffin, Dr. Paul Hankins, Dr. Gary Jennings, Don Allen Mitchell, Dr. Billy Moore, Jeff Slagle, Dr. Murtis Tab, Clint Wood, Dr. Michelle Roberts, and Professor Lee Corr. Thank you all, and for all you do. Because this is our first attempt at a colloquial program, I wanted to let you know a little bit about what we're going to be doing next so that you can plan to be here with us. Our next colloquial presentations will actually be a series of five distinguished speakers during the presidential inauguration week, October 27th through November 1st. Each day, Monday through Thursday of that week, we will be celebrating an individual college or a school or the university, and colloquial speakers will be headlining each day's activity with a keynote lecture. On Monday, October 28th, we will celebrate the School of Nursing with a presentation by Professor Sheila Burke from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Tuesday's feature presentation honoring our College of Education and Human Sciences will be Doris Dixon, an official at the United States Department of Education. On Wednesday, our College of Arts and Sciences will feature former United States Senate Appropriations Committee Staff Director Jim Moorhart, who will also present an electrifying program on Thursday for the aviation program on his surviving the plane crash three years ago in Alaska that claimed the lives of U.S. Senator Ted Stevens and four others. Thursday's program honoring the College of Business will feature colloquial speaker Dr. Jeffrey Lynn, Vice President of George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And the anchor colloquial speaker for the week will be Mississippi's senior United States Senator Thad Cochran at the actual inaugural ceremonies on Friday, November 1. I invite each of you to join us for that spectacular week of colloquial speakers. This evening, at the conclusion of our program, you are all invited to join us with a reception in the foyer in honor of tonight's speaker. I'm delighted to introduce to you tonight as our very first colloquial speaker, Governor William Winter.
It is very fitting that our inaugural speaker be one of Mississippi's own, a legend in government, politics, and in law. Governor, you honor Delta State with your presence here tonight. William F. Winter served as governor of Mississippi from 1980 to 1984. His term as governor has been nationally acclaimed for groundbreaking passage of education reform legislation. Prior to that, he had been elected to the offices of state representative, state tax collector, state treasurer, and the lieutenant governor. He has been chairman of the Southern Regional Education Board, the Appalachian Regional Commission, the Southern Growth Policies Board, Commission on the Future of the South, the National Civic League, Kettering Foundation, the Foundation for the Mid-South, and the Mississippi Department of Archives and History. The governor was a member of President Clinton's National Advisory Board on Race. He was instrumental in the founding of the William Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation at the University of Mississippi, and he was awarded the Profile and Courage Award by the John F. Kennedy Library Foundation. An attorney in the Jones Walker Law Firm in Jackson, Governor Winter is special counsel in that firm's government relations practice group. He is a graduate of the University of Mississippi and its law school where he served as editor-in-chief of the Law Journal. Governor Winter has been awarded honorary degrees from eight universities. Our speaker is married to Elise Varner Winter. They have three daughters, five grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. And we are delighted tonight to have a number of the Varner family relatives in the audience. Would you please stand? The Varners. Thank you. Forty-one years ago, as student government president here at Delta State, I had the privilege of introducing this man when he was lieutenant governor of Mississippi. He came here to speak to our students. He has visited and spoken here several times over the course of his career. He is a leader who has championed fairness, justice, and equality for all Mississippians. He has been a great friend to Mississippi to the Delta, to this university, and to me personally. He is a true Mississippi hero. So tonight, on behalf of a grateful Delta State family, I welcome the governor back to our campus to address a topic near and dear to all of us, reimagining the Delta, our unfinished business. Ladies and gentlemen, the Honorable William F. Winter. Friendship of your distinguished brother. It's been my friend so many years. Worked tirelessly and sometimes uh, fruitlessly in trying to help me get elected governor a long time ago. And as I remember, we never did throw a crowd like that in any of my campaign rallies. So much, uh, so much more pleasant than an experience I had some time ago down in Jackson County. I was coming out of the courthouse, Pastor Gula, and there were two men sitting on the bench. As I walked by, I heard one of them say to the other, that looks like William Winter. I thought he was dead. 
said. And the other one said, well, if you ain't, you ought to be. I'm glad I'm not there tonight. I'm glad that I have this great pleasure of being here and celebrating with you the coming to this, uh, this campus of Elizabeth uh, uh, Lee. You've had the good fortune here at Delta State to have had many impressive leaders. I have personally known most of them. I know the particular president, my anchor president, for my long time. Thank you for being here. Let me pay my tribute to Dr. Wyatt and all of those uh, who have worked. Sir, as president of this university, it is a distinguished group of leaders. And now, I, I'm going to tell you, I think you'll really get the jackpot. Uh, with the ascendancy of Bill LaForge, the, Lord, uh, the presidency of this university, you just can't do any better than that. And I, 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 I predict uh, that he will be that he will be recorded as one of the all-time great leaders of the uh, Coming back to this campus tonight, obviously it brings uh, for me a lot of. All of the great Delta State family for your friendship and your support for a long period of time. But in the time that I have been allotted tonight, and I do not want to take advantage of your time by talking too long, let me simply say that I want to spend a few minutes talking about this special place that most of you will called the Delta, and about this special university, uh, which I consider to be the intellectual and intellectual capital of the Delta. Now, I was not born in the Delta, but I could almost see it on that uh, later County farm of where I grew up. And in my boyhood imagination, it was a kind of mythical dream land and everybody who lived on it was incredibly rich. So much for imagination. I could not define the Delta then, nor can I now. I have watched with interest as others over the years have tried. One of its most distinguished and learned scholars and distinguished sons was David Cohn from Greenland. I wrote of the Delta in the 1940s in the fascinating book where I was born and raised. And at about the same time, uh, William Alexander Percy wrote the still familiar land on the levee. In more recent years, the historian Jim Cobb has called it the most southern place on earth in his book of that name. Because it has always been contrast and contradiction. The Delta remains an enigma for many people. Maybe tonight, this is a good time to do some reimagining about this intriguing area and the role of this university in its future. I must confess that I have trouble remembering what this region and, for that matter, this entire state looked like 65 or so years ago when I first was elected to the Mississippi Legislature from Grenada County. No one 
No one could have foreseen the extent to which so many things would be different, would change in that period of time. This pattern of change has, has occurred almost everywhere, of course, but I think it is fair to say that few places in the South and in this country have seen as much social and economic change as we have in Mississippi and specifically in this unique region of Mississippi. It goes without saying that this change did not happen without a lot of controversy. But because there were enough far-sighted and dedicated community leaders, black and white, to work together to create a fairer and more inclusive society, the Delta has now laid the foundation for a much brighter future. The men, these men and women to whom I refer, understood that not only by cooperating across old lines of race and class that they had, uh, that had previously separated them, that they could build a better way of life. You know, though, how hard it was to get a lot of folks to put aside their old insular biases and feelings their reluctance to embrace new attitudes and new ways of doing things. I personally remember how hard it was on the political front to overcome the old mindsets and the old suspicions. But thank God we have put most of those old fears behind. And let me add that the, that the forward-thinking leadership and influence found at this university has been a huge factor in that progress. This is an essential role that this institution must continue to play. It is out of the intellectual leadership on this campus that there must come the constructive ideas which will guide the region. There are two overriding causes that it seems to me arise above everything else. They are public education and racial reconciliation. It is here that this university has an inescapable duty to lead. If you ask me this evening what I consider have been the two most transforming developments that have taken place in Mississippi in my lifetime. I would unhesitating, unhesitatingly tell you that it was first the elimination of Jim Crow, legal racial segregation in the 1960s. And secondly, it has been the, in the public recognition in the 1980s and 1990s of the need to build a truly competitive system of public education where nobody gets left out. Now let me say here that I don't believe there's any state, and I don't think I'm, I'm exaggerating, I don't believe there's any state that has come further, that has come further in these two areas in the last three or four decades than has Mississippi. We can all take pride and reassurance in how much progress we have made. But unless we be inclined to rest on our laurels, let me remind you of how far we still have to go. Let me talk first about education. First, the good part. In many communities, we now have some of the best public schools to be found anywhere in the country. I know that firsthand because my wife, Elise, and I have five well-educated and socially mature grandchildren, all of them products of Mississippi public schools. They are prepared to compete with anybody anywhere. And they are comfortable in that in any social or racial environment. In higher education, we have nationally respected state universities. 
like this campus, like Delta State University, where cutting edge teaching and research are now being carried on. And we also have a great network of outstanding community colleges. We've established a new application of technical and intellectual attainment that did not previously exist, but that is now doing so much to accelerate the progress of our state. But with the good news, let me present you with some very sober issues. In the face of the economic problem that we are confronted with now, it is, not an over, it is not an overstatement to say that the task which confronts us is a more difficult one than we have ever known before. In addition to having less public revenue, here is why the task is so hard. I'm talking about public education. In the first place, we have the country's third highest poverty rate. One out of four children in Mississippi lives below the poverty level, and 12% live in extreme poverty. In the Delta, these figures are significantly higher. These children are automatically at risk. They tend to drop out of school, become involved in the juvenile justice system, and become teenage parents. These factors doom most of them to premature economic dependence. And it has become a generational problem for many families in this particular area. And even though we have made commendable progress in Mississippi in the last 25 years in improving the quality of our schools, the fact remains that we are still abysmally low in graduation rates and in student achievement. I've read with interest uh, and some dismay the recent uh, statistical reports on education in our state and in the Delta. Take the high school dropout rate, for example. While there is considerable disagreement on how that is compiled, it appears that the average is about 26% statewide. With some of the poorer districts in the Delta, where it is over 40%, the percentage of adults with a high school diploma is still only about 68%. And that simply means that almost one in three adults is a high school dropout. And the numbers for the Delta are worse. Reducing the percentage Reducing that percentage is absolutely essential to the future economic development of Mississippi. It is doubly important in the Delta because there is so much ground to make up. There are no silver bullets. It will involve dealing with all of these daunting problems that I've just mentioned, and dealing with them realistically and intelligently and with persistence. It will be a process as complicated as reshaping a culture in many of the poorer communities that will cause them to recognize that their children cannot effectively compete in today's world unless they get a competitive education. And I will repeat here what I've said so many times. The only road out of poverty runs by the schoolhouse. But creating this attitude and this commitment is a task that cannot be left to the schools alone to assume. Schools can effectively educate and teachers can teach only when there is a commensurate and recognized responsibility on the part of parents to prepare and support their children in their educational quest. But for many poor parents, and especially single parents, that frequently is not done. And so children grow up with the parental and home, without the parental and home guidance that they must have. The result is a continuing cycle of childhood neglect that dooms one generation after another to a life of dependency and despair. 
if I would suggest one thing tonight that in my opinion will make more of a difference over the long haul than anything else in breaking out of that appalling age-old condition, it would be the creation of a comprehensive state-funded system of pre-kindergarten education and nurture. The, the evidence is unassailable that such a program is essential if we are to materially lower the dropout rate in our schools. It is in the first five years of life, and I'm saying some things here that all of you, I think, know as well as I do. It is in the, it is in the first five years of life that the initial critical physical and intellectual development of the brain takes place. In too many cases, that development is neglected in economically and culturally deprived homes. Every other state, and now hopefully Mississippi, has in place or is aggressively putting in place a system that will address that huge void. We shall continue to have an unacceptable dropout rate with all of its attendant woes until we seriously begin to address this phase of our system. Now, there are those who say, uh, well, we just can't afford it, especially when we're now facing extreme uh, cutbacks in our established programs when we're talking about furloughing teachers and increasing class sizes and shortening the school year. But I'm not talking about letting that happen either. We must finance our present system at an increased level in view of the fact that we are already spending less for people than any other state except one. I, of course, know that we're going through some challenging economic times, but we have been through a lot worse. What I also know is that by anybody's standards, we are a much richer state than we have ever been. Don't tell me that we can't afford to invest a little more in the education of our people. We've demonstrated that we can do whatever we set our minds to do. It seems to me that we are faced with a very clear choice now. Rather than an overly simplistic approach of simply cutting programs right and left with all of the egregious effects that such a policy would have on the quality of life in our state, I believe that we need to find a way to put more talented administrators and more talented teachers, especially in our low-performing public schools, right here in the Delta. My friend Jim Barksdale, who has, as I told him, has put his money where my mouth was in supporting, in supporting education. Jim Barksdale cites where just one talented ind individual, a man named Michael uh, Cormack, uh, can do. Michael came out of the Teach for America program, and uh, he has gone over to Lambert in Quitman County. Some of you may be from that area and know what I'm talking about. Two years ago, three years ago, he went over there to a school that was F, rated last, absolutely last, in its terms of its effectiveness. That school is now up 60% in its scores. They went from an F rating to a C rating, and now they're moving up another notch to a B. And, and this is what Jim Barksdale has to say about that. This, I'm quoting him now. Uh, Jim said, don't listen to all the people that say, oh, those children didn't come to school to learn, or it's their parents' fault. First night, the first year, that this new principal came in. We had 5% of the parents come to parents' night. Last fall, the third fall, we had 95% come. Why? Why the difference? 
because they took pride, they took pride in what their children were learning. They are, they are starting to participate. The parents are participating. It, it's nothing like being on a winning team, Jim Barksdale said. Lambert, Mississippi disproves everything you hear or read about why our children aren't learning. They can learn, they will learn, they want to learn, but they have a lot of obstacles to overcome. And what we need are more Michael Cormack, more school districts willing to take a chance. And by the way, Michael changed only about 10% of the staff at that school. He didn't run everybody off. There were a few people he couldn't, couldn't get with the program. I'm still quoting Jim Barksdale. But he brought in teachers from the Teach for America program. They got put in Lambert, wonderful young people from all over the country. But I don't have to tell you here at Delta State about the Teach for America program because you are training members of that program here at being the central point in this area of Mississippi. Now, I have referred to this university, and I think properly so, as the cultural and intellectual capital of the Delta. I believe that to be the case. May I tonight presumptuously suggest the Delta State established almost a century ago as a primary source of educational leadership in the Delta reimagine an additional role by creatively providing state and legislative leaders and the public with credible and unbiased research about what really works in the schools and what will and, and, that, and that this information will then command the attention and support of public leaders. This would be consistent, I think, with the historic role of this university in providing leadership in public education. Now that on education, now let me turn to the other great challenge that we can't overlook. In spite of all of the progress that we've made in the last few decades, the issue of race remains the most difficult and intractable problem that our region and our nation faces. Why is this so? It is because we still have not come to terms with the deep-seated, little understood, and usually repressed feelings that are derived from our different backgrounds. The old stereotypes die hard. Let's face this fact. All of us are the products of our life experience and the times and conditions in which we were raised. For many of those life experiences have included discrimination and exclusion and bad memories. For others, those experiences have been where privilege and acceptance have been taken for granted, as has been my case. I have a lot of well-meaning friends, white friends, who cannot be characterized as racist by any means, but who simply feel that it is unnecessary or even counterproductive to try to do anything to resolve these differences that still exist. They argue that it is just a waste of time because there isn't much we can do and that it is just better to let things alone. The only problem with that is that it doesn't work that way. Our society is rapidly becoming more diverse, more complicated racism, more subject to misunderstanding and mistrust, more caught up in white flight and resegregation. Unless we come together, to work at eliminating or at least reducing the remaining areas of racial tension and misunderstanding. This region, this Delta region, this state, this country are not going to be as good for our children 
and our grandchildren to live in as they ought to be. Given the fabulous natural wealth and advanced social and educational institutions that we have, that would be a tragedy indeed. If we let divisions over race diminish the quality of our lives as it has too often in the past. I believe that our ability to exist as a responsible and unified society in the future will depend on how well we eliminate a stratification of our citizenry based on race. A beginning point in this process may be a simple recognition that we do not and probably cannot see a great many issues from the same perspective. How far we think we have come in race relations depend largely on where we stand. Most white people think that we've come further than most black people think we have. But what we can agree on is the proposition that we must provide an opportunity to every person, regardless of race or class, to secure a competitive education and to be able to compete on a level playing field, and that racism, racism in whatever form it is, is, it is expressed, whether by speech or act, must be considered outside the bounds of acceptable conduct in our society. But having said that, let me also say that the cause of improved race relations is not served by using the issue of race as an excuse for not going to school or not acting responsibly. Nothing is so self-defeating as falling into the trap of playing the victim's role. All of this is a matter of trying to be honest with ourselves and with each other. It is a matter of developing a sense of trust based on everybody, black and white, trying to start from the same place. For us white folks, it must begin with an acknowledgement of our complicity in the creating and supporting of an inhuman, and indefensible system based on, on enslaving and exploiting people of a different race. For black people, it means being able to forgive even while still remembering the horrors of the past. But there must come a time in the lives of all of us when we must recognize that we are all in this together. When we must move past the old divisions of race and recognize our common interests and our common humanity. But unfortunately, that is not going to automatically happen. It will happen happen only as enough of us, black and white, work to make it happen. The liberation of all of us from our old biases and prejudices will finally enable us to ensure that our children and grandchildren will inherit a better place to live than has existed before. That is the kind of responsible citizenship that we must embrace. In doing the things that may not immediately and directly benefit us, but will create for those who come after us the opportunity for a more fulfilling and productive life. And that's why I'm so pleased to stand here and hear about the, the initiatives that are being undertaken on this campus to emphasize your recognition of the work of racial reconciliation. It has to be done. I especially applaud the leadership of Georgine Clark, as director of the Multicultural Affairs Office here on, on this campus. And I know of how many of you are working in that cause. I know of the close relationship that you've established with the Winter Institute for Racial Reconciliation at Ole Miss, and of your plans for a conference on race here on that campus, here on this campus next spring. Because of where you are here in the depth, you can be and you must be a flagship institution in addressing this vital issue of racial reconciliation. Now, in discussing only two primary areas of activity, 
I realize that I have overlooked the other, so many other age-old issues, like poverty and health care, which the Delta has faced for so long. A lot of folks have given up on wanting, on waiting for a rising tide to raise all boats. Given up hope to trickle down, econ economics will trickle down to Chula and Arcola. But we have to remember that programs aimed at moving the poor into the economic mainstream require that, they, that there be a mainstream for them to enter. No, nobody knows better how to expand that man, mainstream than those of you connected with this intellectual capital of the Delta. But it is going to take more collaboration and partnering than we've ever had before. It will mean building the capacity for local development. It will mean building the physical facilities, but also the human relationships necessary to have a true sense of community where people work together instead of pulling in opposite directions. These daunting tasks present a challenge that concentrates on the leadership represented right here in this room and right here on this campus. It seems to me that this is an almost magical coming together at a fortuitous time in the history of this university. The energized and creative leadership which I now see here in Delta State personified by your distinguished president. This can be and will be a force that will change this region for the better or else. Together, you can accomplish for this region what government programs and market forces have so far been unable to do. And that is to give our people the educational and economic opportunity to prosper wherever, to prosper wherever they live wherever they choose to live, whether it be here in the warm and familiar surroundings of this great Delta region, or whether it be anywhere on the face of the earth. That, it seems to me, is a task worthy of the noble heritage of Delta State University. Thank you so much. Winter, thank you for those very inspirational words. The governor has agreed to entertain a few questions. If you will just identify yourself, we'll call on you, and I'll repeat the question so that he and everyone else can hear what it is. We have students behind us here, too. So, uh, anyone? Please, go ahead. What exactly do you mean by pre-kindergarten? Would you repeat that? What exactly do you mean by pre-kindergarten? Pre-kindergarten. What do you mean by pre-kindergarten? Specifically what it says, pre-kindergarten. Kindergarten starts at five years period between birth and entry in the eligible, eligibility for entry in the kindergarten constitutes the most critical years in the development of, of a human being's brain. And so many times, as I just said, that brain doesn't get developed very well. And people who know, know, know a whole lot more about it than I do say that by the time a kid is four or five years old, the, the development of the brain 
uh, is, is pretty well de determined in terms of its capacity for expansion. And some tell me that by, by the time they get to kindergarten, it's, it's already too late for them fully to develop their intellectual capacity. So those years are being wasted on so many children, so many children born in frequently in the, in the socioeconomic uh, deprived system conditions. They just never, they never will be able to be competitive. And the only way we can make them competitive is to expose them to training, to development, to nurture that will make up for the deprivation that their economic and social circumstances create for them. I think it's, I think it's the most important time. I, I have, I have made this statement, and, I, and I, I, nobody really disagrees with me publicly. If we're going, to, if we're going to make investments in education, we must make more. I would suggest leaving off the senior year in high school and putting that money in pre-K. I don't want to do. I don't want to do that, and I, th I don't think we have to do that. But that's how. That's how valuable I think a pre-K, a comprehensive, state-supported pre-K program would be, and how much difference it would make. Understand, and I, I, I said it, it is not fair to put the burden of creating the means of doing that on the students. It has to start here. It has to start in this room tonight. It has to start with developing public support, understanding of uh, how important this is. Frankly, it has to start with the intellectual leadership that I have uh, that I have suggested that, that this university must play and has played for so long. But to make sure that the people understand and that the legislators understand and the public leaders understand that this is an investment we have to make. And I'm not I'm not uh, particular about where the money comes from. I think. I think, frankly, we could we could find some means of uh, some additional revenue. Uh, we we I said this while ago. We can do anything we want to do. We we can pay for whatever we want to pay for. It's just got to it's, 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 it's the public has to have a high priority and understand why that priority is so important. So it's a matter of public education. We we live in a country that operate on the basis of, of public support and uh, developing that public support, that public opinion. Let us, let us all genuine, genuinely interested in the future of this region and this state, let us all be advocates, advocates with our friends, with our neighbors, with folks that we have contact with that we have influence with so that the people who actually push the buttons down their jacks will push a button that will support, provide the revenue, provide the means that we can have systematic pre-K education. But all right. Wow, sound interesting.
I don't hear very well, and I didn't get all of that. How do, you, how do you get folks to do what I've been suggesting doing is, is, is the question, I think. And, and, and it, 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 seriously, it, it, this is not an evasive answer. Seriously, it gets around to having enough people understand uh, the priorities that, that, that we have in front of us and who are willing uh, to join in, in, a, in, a public, in a public effort. Legislators, public officials, we politicians, we respond more often than not to what we think the people want. And sometimes the people really don't know what they want. And so there has to be a process by which more people understand the significance of these priorities. And again, I get back, and I don't want to pile an unnecessary, impossible burden uh, on an institution like this university. But uh, as, as I said, I think if, 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 if this university can use its huge resources to survey, research, and develop credible ideas about how we go about doing the things that I think all of us in this room want to have done, I think that would have as much an impact on decision making at the legislative level, state governmental level, local governmental level as anything I can think of. If, if you have a credible report coming out of Delta State University, backed by the best minds that you have here, I think that would have more credibility, frankly, than some report put out by the Department of Education what? I think if we can have that kind of local buy-in, it will make a huge difference. I think too often, too many of us tend to say, well, let's, you know, let's let somebody else do it. As I said a while ago, we, we found that, 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 that we're not going to solve problems on, on, on some on some highly publicized uh, uh, project that somebody uh, in, a, in an ivory tower somewhere has thought up. We are, we, we are more likely to respond. Governmental officials are more likely to respond. The people who are on the ground, who know what it's like every day to teach kids what they lack, what they don't have, I think that's the kind of help that we need, and that's where I think uh, I think this school and, and the communities that are represented here tonight can do so much to build that to build that case. Uh, and if we don't do it, who is going to do it? That's how that's how we finally passed the Education Reform Act in 1982. We went out and we discovered that there were a lot of people who wanted to be involved in, 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 in passing that legislation. And they made their voices heard, and thank goodness the legislature responded to it. Uh, it would not have happened had we not had those voices out there from the local community. I wanted to know, outside, in addition to governmental funding, what can a community do as a whole? What can a community do as a whole? Well. Uh, the question is, what, what can a community do to make these things happen? Uh, I, I've, I've not been very articulate in, 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 in defining that, 
Uh, but uh, I have to repeat myself, uh, I think that has to be developed in the community, and only, only the community can do this. But it has to have, it has to have credible basis for, for getting involved, and that's why I say uh, the work here on this university campus in, in developing information that's credible, that folks will believe, it's not from some fall place, this is hometown stuff, and, and put that out and let enough people in that community tell each other, this is something we need, this is something we have to have, and that's how it works. Yeah, well, uh, again, uh, you, you, you rest you're restating the problem that I have already stated. And the, quest the question is how, why, why we call it on the schools to do all this when we have to start at home? And uh, I, I couldn't agree more. We do have to start at home, and uh, but there has to be there has to be an inspiration somehow put into a lot of these homes that that are without inspiration now. We just got to do a better job of informing people about what they put their real choices on. Yes, sir. Hi, Governor. Um, as a business owner myself, I have one question that I would like to ask. Um, already, profits of my business have decreased by at least 10%. I just would like to know how you plan to fund all of these big programs. Because if it's planned on a tax hike, my business might as well shut down. Well, I, I, well, listen. I, I, I knew that, I knew this question was coming sooner or later. Who's going to pay for it? And 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 this uh, young man has said that that my business would not permit me to pay any more taxes. Uh, I I, rec I recognize. That dilemma, and it's a dilemma that faces the whole country. That's uh, that's one of the things that's kind of shut, shut down the government. The disagreement over uh, how much and who will pay the taxes. But again, I say, and I and I really I really believe this. We will pay for whatever we think is important. I'm speaking I'm speaking in terms of the, of the community as a whole. I think taxes ought to be fair. I think they ought to be uh, based on the ability, on the ability to pay, to pay, not put folks out of business, but also to have us understand that, that we live, we live under a contract in this country that we've almost forgotten about. It's a contract that was expressed in the Declaration of Independence. We pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's a contract on which this country was established. And all of us have got to be, consider ourselves parties to that contract. So we pledge to each other to doing whatever is necessary to, to provide our children with the best education they can get. We pledge our fortunes to doing that. So without picking on anybody or without being unfair in terms of how taxes are levied, I still tell you that these are times when we can afford to do whatever we think is important enough. I'm a great football fan. I'm going to go see a lot of football games. And I pay, I pay extra to get good seats. And a lot of folks pay a lot of money for things they like, for things they're interested in. Build football stage. Nothing wrong with it. I'm all for it. The point I make is, though, that we've also got to be as, as, as generous in our support of education. Institutions like this, Delta State University, we, we need to increase our investments in education. And, uh, 
that's what I, where all of us need to come together and understand that nothing is for free. We have to give up something. We have to decide what's important in our lives. Most important thing in my life, and I'm 90 years old, is to see to it that my children and my five, my three grand, my five grand, my three children, my five grandchildren, my two great grandchildren. My interest now is in seeing to it that they inherit a country where they can develop a, 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 a satisfying and fulfilling quality of life as they possibly can. And we need to make the investments that will ensure that that is the Good evening. Um, my name is Kristen Spork. I'm a current student here at Delta State. And um, I haven't lived here in Mississippi for very long. I'm not a Mississippi native. But what I've noticed is there's something, and I could be wrong, but there's something called a Head Start program. And I was just kind of curious how that is distinct. There's no systematic state-supported free trade going on. Yeah, I know individual individual communities have and do have some free trade work, but it's not a comprehensive and it's not systematic and it's certainly not uh, equal in quality everywhere. Does that have squares with Head Start? How does it square with oh, Head Start? Oh, Your I, idea I, with Head Start? Build on build on Head Start. That's where so much of, so much of pre-K is being carried out now. But again, there's an un, there's an inequality in terms of access and in terms of uh, of how well the program is is, is doing. Uh, I think I think if we combine our efforts and put it into a systematic systematic uh, uh, totally supported public supported. Uh, process, we would get a lot more for our money. Well, it's, obviously it is. Uh, some, some communities have it and some don't have it. Uh, some, some have good programs and some don't have very good programs. So it's not safe, no. Head Start is not safe. No. No. Okay. Yeah, good, good question. Okay, let's see. That's the option. Mr. President, I think I have overstayed my welcome. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. We'll come right here. Ladies and gentlemen, in establishing the Delta State University Colloquium, we have had specially made a medal to be presented to each colloquia speaker as a special memento of the occasion of his or her presentation. So with great pleasure, I present to Governor William Winter the very first Delta State University Colloquium Medal. And you've heard of Delta hospitality, which trumps Mississippi hospitality. You have to have your gift basket. It includes a fighting oak or dolls, some chocolates, <laughs> and all sorts of other fun things for you to take home. That's great. And share with your family. That's we appreciate very much your being with us tonight. We invite all of you to join the governor for a reception in the foyer immediately following. Thank you for being here.